Scott Ritter is with us again. Scott, it's always a pleasure. In, in, in reading one of your more recent statements, I'm not sure if it was an essay uh, that you wrote or if you were being quoted uh, on another uh, platform, uh, you warned of the dangers of thermonuclear war uh, starting in Ukraine. Can you explain? Certainly. I mean, I, I think it's no longer a debate whether or not this conflict is a proxy conflict between NATO and Russia. I think, uh, I mean, when, when even the Ukrainian defense minister is coming out and saying, hey, it's a proxy war between NATO and Russia. We're the ones dying. You need to give us more weapons. It should be clear that that's what's going on. This is, uh, for Russia, it's an existential uh, conflict. Uh, they, they cannot afford to lose this. Uh, NATO claims it's an existential conflict, but the fact of the matter is NATO can survive uh, if Russia wins in Ukraine because NATO survived without Ukraine for its entire history. Uh, having Ukraine is not uh, essential, but NATO's making it appear as if a Russian victory in Ukraine is a defeat for NATO. Therefore, what? Uh, is NATO going to accept this defeat? Is NATO going to escalate to avoid uh, the defeat? And it appears right now NATO is seeking to escalate. Uh, we, we see them talking about providing not just Patriot batteries, but now there's discussion the British are going to uh, cough up 14 Challenger 2 tanks in an effort to pressure Germany uh, to give the green light for the release of the Leopard 2 tank. Um, and, you know, for, the, for what purpose? Is it to uh, simply drag on this conflict to fulfill Lloyd Austin's ambition of uh, bringing harm to Russia, or is it to actually in, enable Ukraine to win? But a Ukrainian victory means Ukraine would, according to Ukraine's own definition of victory, recapture the Donbass, reconquer Zaporizhia and Kherson, and reconquer Kherson, which means they're going to war against Russia, mother Russia, because Russia has absorbed these nations under Article 64 of their Russia. Let me just this means nuclear conflict. According to Zelensky, it would also require the recapture of Crimea. Yeah, that's what I meant, yeah, which is, I mean, which there's is no almost, doubt about that being Russia. Inconceivable. To quote, uh, to quote the Sicilian from uh, the Princess Bride, yes. Right. Uh, and so, I mean, this kind of ridiculousness, I mean, when NATO is setting itself up to provide weaponry to Ukraine, when Ukraine says it needs this weaponry to do the inconceivable, um, it, it creates, at least on paper, the potential for thermonuclear war. Okay, so now, how does thermonuclear okay. war First of all, is there a difference between nuclear war and thermonuclear war? I'm just basically, you know, we're 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 modernizing, um, you know, the 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 Nagasaki and Hiroshima events today. You know, when you say nuclear war, the implication is atomic bombs. Thermonuclear war would be hydrogen bombs, just okay. weapons. Of now, are are these? Um, before we get into who's going to start it and what's going to happen, just a little bit about the mechanics. Are these big boys, as they called? Uh, Nagasaki that are dropped from a huge bomber, or are they something that can be fired from a, from a tank? Well, first, they can't be fired from a tank, but they can be fired from artillery pieces. Uh, and the, the, the artillery rounds today are, the, are as powerful as the bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And um, do, those they, were, do they have the same nuclear fallout that destroys life and property well beyond the area that they strike? Some of the smaller weapons are designed. Uh, we, we called them back in the in the seventies and eighties, uh, neutron bombs. Basically, to generate a lot of neutrons, which will kill people through radioactivity, but minimize the uh, the fallout, so that uh, in theory, you know, hours or days after the device, you could drive through there without fear of dying of uh, radioactivity. But the big boys, the the ones that are the the one hundred and fifty to three hundred uh, megaton bombs that are sitting on most of our missiles. Um, these are city killers. And when I say city killer, I mean the entire city, not just the heart of the city like Nagasaki, Hiroshima, the entire city. And the fallout from these um, will make the area struck uh, uninhabitable for uh, thousands of years. Um, so, and, and if you drop enough of them, then the earth becomes uninhabitable for thousands, which means mankind's gone. So I would imagine that whoever uses these offensively, having designs on the real estate, whether it be Putin who wants to make it return to Russia or whether it be NATO that wants it to be a country beholden to NATO, 
would use the lowest yield that they have so as to cause the least amount of permanent damage. Is that fair uh, and sensible reasoning on my part? If this was going to be a, a limited nuclear conflict using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, for instance, it's reasonable to say, but Russia has said straight up, we're not dropping nuclear weapons on Ukraine. If we use nuclear weapons, we're dropping them on London, Berlin, Paris, Washington, D.C. The world will end. See, Russia doesn't play limited nuclear war. Russia doesn't play these games. This is purely a construct in the Western mind that somehow you can limit nuclear conflict. Russia's made it clear. We won't be the first to use nuclear weapons, Vladimir Putin says. He said he also said we won't be the second. And what that means is once you fire them at us, we're not waiting for them to hit. We're launching everything we got at you and we'll all die but at least we'll go to heaven as martyrs. You'll go to heaven as the idiots who started a nuclear conflict. Does, does he have, does he have ta tactical nuclear weapons or does he have big boys? Let's just use that terminology. Tactical nuclear weapons to mean you can go there a week later. People are dead, but you, you, you'd be alive surveying the property. Big boys meaning, forget about it, everything's gone like Nagasaki was for a couple of generations. You know, Russia got rid of its artillery delivered nuclear weapons a while ago, and those are the ones that would most tend to be so-called clean weapons. Um, they do have tactical nuclear weapons that are that can be loaded on uh, their their uh, short range ballistic missile force. But I don't know, to be honest, uh, how clean they are, or dirty they are. Um, but the, the 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 fact of the matter is, if if a conflict goes nuclear, uh, the big boys are going to be brought out and it's just going to get dirty and Russia won't care because Russia has said at that point in time, the world ends. We know it. We're not, we don't care if it's dirty, whatever. If you bring nuclear weapons against us, no matter what, we're going to kill everything. Okay. Do you believe Putin, or let me say it differently, is Putin credible when he says he won't use nuclear weapons first? Absolutely. 100% credible. Well, well, then who, well, then who would? I mean, we would. Germany Our doctrine. Not, Germany's not going to do it without Joe Biden saying, OK, Biden would be insane. He may, he, he may have memory problems and he may look and act older than he is, but I don't think he's crazy, is he? Well, I don't know. Biden ran on a, a platform of uh, uh, bringing U.S. nuclear doctrine back to what he called sole purpose, which means the only purpose for us having these weapons is nuclear deterrent, sort of like what the Russians are saying. OK, so who, who us? would fire the first round NATO with the approval of the United States and a consensus among NATO ministers? No, the United States would do it unilaterally uh, per our doctrine. Remember, Joe Biden just published last October the National Security Strategy of the United States, which includes the nuclear posture, and he lied about his campaign promise because instead of simplifying American nuclear doctrine to only responding, we now have a doctrine that says we can use nuclear weapons preemptively um, in a non-nuclear environment, which basically says we can make up any reason in the world we want to use nuclear weapons first. We are the nation that speaks about first strike, not Russia, the United States. So the nation that's going to start this thing, if it goes nuclear, it's going to be us because that's our doctrine. That's how we're programmed to think. All right. So tell me how this would work. Uh, a plane would leave from where with what kind of a weapon on it? And it would drop this thing on what? Well, it, first of all, it'll start out probably this, this is the way it's going to start out. The United States is building um, technologies and supporting doctrine that lead us to believe we can launch a preemptive non-nuclear strike against Russian leadership, that we can decapitate Moscow. So we believe that, for instance, if we deploy the Dark Eagle 2 into Germany, we can fire this hypersonic missile within five minutes of launch will strike the Kremlin, killing Putin, throwing Russia into disarray. Um, what will happen if we do that is, let's say we get lucky and we kill Putin. The Russians have something called the dead hand. And the dead hand is just that. You killed Putin, doesn't matter. The dead hand hits the button and everything goes. There's nothing we can do to stop that. Now, there's some belief that we can combine this preemptive strike with a first strike nuclear attack against Russia's strategic arsenal so we can limit it so that whatever survives, even if the dead hand goes off, we will have ballistic missile intercept capabilities on naval ships and elsewhere that can shoot these down to minimize the damage. So Russia gets destroyed and we either get nothing or just a very little and we declare victory. 
That's not how it's going to work, though, because Russia has said, we know what you're doing. That's why we have invented, for instance, the Poseidon, which goes on the submarine that out there. The Poseidon is a nuclear-powered giant torpedo. When we fire it, it just goes, and it will show up on the coast of the United States, blow up, and launch a massive tidal wave that will destroy all the coastal cities. They have this weapon. It's ready. It's there. They have the Sarmat, which is a giant missile that doesn't fly into our missile defense. It flies over the South Pole coming in from behind and dropping 12, 13 nuclear weapons, avant-garde, uh, hypersonic that cannot be intercepted, destroying American cities. The, the American nuclear thinkers are literally insane. And this is why it's so important that we get arms control back on the agenda. You know, we have a, the, the Russians gave, put an ambassador in, in, the, in Washington, D.C., Anatoly Antonov, who negotiated the last New START treaty. Here's a chance for America to work with a Russian ambassador to get arms control on the table. And he just sits there doing nothing because we're ignoring him. Why is there no, um, why are there no back channels of communication or even front channels of communication? Why, why isn't Tony Blinken talking to uh, the Russian ambassador or to his opposite number, uh, Lavrov? I mean, do you want my honest answer? Because Tony Blinken's an idiot um, because he's a moron. Right, uh, he's well, Jake most... Sullivan's not uh, an idiot. Why isn't it... Jake Sullivan's a propagandist, a communications specialist who's operating way out of his depth. He knows nothing about nuclear weapons, nothing about nuclear disarmament. Well, there must be re... somebody that works for a Joe Biden that could have... We got rid of them all, Judge. Who? We got rid of them all. We used to have an entire you know, padre... Uh, we had a deep bench of arms control experts, arms control specialists. But like any muscle, if you don't use it, it atrophies. We got rid of them all. We don't have any more arms control specialists. We have Tony Blinken's, Jake Sullivan's, and other propagandists. Talk to the – invite. I tell – not challenge you. I, I, I request you. Invite the U.S. Um, Secretary in the State Department responsible for arms control onto your show and ask this person – who runs disarmament policy in America? And the honest answer she'll give you is the Defense Department. And when you have the people who have the weapons and are planning to use the weapons, and you're relying upon them to come up with the policy to get rid of the weapons, you'll be turning blue in the face before this happens. We don't have an arms control community anymore worthy of the name. This is the danger of this. Tony Blinken needs to be fired on the spot and replaced with somebody who is thinking about the future of grandchildren and next generations. Because right now we have people playing stupid political games and they're putting the entire safety of the world on the line. At we least the Russians have people ready to talk. We don't. We know that Joe Biden's not going to fire Tony Blinken. We no. know from the discovery of the uh, classified or national defense information documents at the Penn Biden Center that the Penn Biden Center was basically the Biden administration foreign policy team in waiting, that the Penn Biden Center was actually run by Tony Blinken. To the extent that old Joe has a brain, Tony is one is one half of it. Uh, but I get, uh, I get your argument. Let's take a step back uh, from Armageddon <laughs> and talk about uh, Putin. What uh, confronts Putin if he wins this war? Is he confronted by 20 years of guerrilla warfare? No. Uh, Putin will be confronted by a chastised and defeated Europe uh, that will come to grips with the reality that the disaster that has befallen them was because of the United States and their willingness to follow blindly the United States into the abyss. And hopefully a Europe that's ready to sit down and talk with Russia responsibly about what, what Russia wanted to talk about in December of 2021 before this war started, which is a new European security framework. Already we hear Europeans saying, we have to, McClone, even Schultz, others are saying, we have to look out for ourselves. We need to have a European security concept that is free of the pressures from the United States because this isn't working out. This isn't working out to our advantage. Now, there's still some political elites out there who yeah, continue to articulate your, the American talking points. Put your fertile and experienced brain into the mind of the more uh, super patriotic uh, Ukrainians 
who don't care a, a, a whit about uh, Zelensky. They just want to win. They're not going to lay over uh, and let a Russian-oriented politician run their government, are they? Aren't they going to engage in some sort of perpetual war against whoever replaces Zelensky, whether it's a Ukrainian who accepts reality or whether it's an import from Moscow? Well, and the Russians know this as well. So this is why Russian victory will be predicated upon killing every one of those super patriotic Ukrainians possible. And if you've engaged Europe responsibly, meaning that you're not dictating terms of surrender to Europe. You're telling Europe, we want to live peacefully. We want to coexist when it, with a new treaty-related European security framework. Um, Europe won't give sanctuary to these Ukrainians. They'll be homeless. They'll have to go to the United States, Ukraine, Australia, and then they'll fester there, uh, putting up their monuments to new Nazi-like heroes, but they'll have no power. But no, Russia can't stop this war sh that in a way that allows this kind of hateful anti-Russian ideology to continue to exist in Ukraine. Russia's only path to victory is to kill them all or drive them all out. If um, Joe Biden were to ask you to participate in a back channel, who would you talk to and what would you tell them? I guess you'd call Zelensky first and say, dial it back. I'm about to negotiate an end to this. No, I, I'd keep Zelensky. He's, he's not a player. Zelensky's not a player, and I'd make him know that from the start. Well, that's you're why not I'm a player. Dial it back. Stay out of the picture. We're taking. No, nope. stay in the picture all you want, Zelensky. You're going to die. We're not going. What I'm telling Zelensky is, we're not going to save you anymore. Okay, it's all on your shoulders. You can either choose to die now or later, or you can surrender and live. But I don't care. I'm writing Ukraine off the picture, and I'm dealing with the future of the world right now because Ukraine cannot be allowed to dictate the terms of survival to the world. And that's what Ukraine thinks they what can do right now. So what survival be from the Russian perspective? Putin has said many times he doesn't want Kiev. He just wants just wants the remainder of the country to be neutral and non-Western. Yeah, look, right now, if I were talking with the, the Russians, my number one priority would be to stabilize relations. And that means we have to bring it into this conflict. And we need to do so in a manner that preserves Ukraine as a viable nation state. So I would be asking Putin to terminate the war short of taking Odessa to at least give the Ukrainians access to the sea so that their economy can survive and that we will work with him and I'll work with my European allies to make sure there's no sanctuary for the Banderists uh, to work with them on making a truly neutral Ukraine. In exchange, in exchange, I need the Russians to actually now sit down. We have to do arms control. We have to do arms control in a meaningful fashion. Um, we have to get past this impasse. But the problem here is, it's sort of hypocritical of me because it's not Russia that's causing the problems in arms control, it's ourselves. So I have to convince the Russians right. that we're now serious about arms control. I, I have given you a nearly, a nearly impossible task in this, uh, in this hypothetical. But there, there's no hope, according to you and your observations and, and your sources of information. There's no hope for a rational back channel or even overt series of uh, negotiations to end this in a, in a rational, meaningful, and quick way. Am I right? No, the, the United States right now is married to a, um, a, a fantasy, the fantasy that somehow um, a peace can be uh, attained with Russia willingly giving up Ukraine, uh, giving up the territories that they've absorbed already, including Crimea. That just isn't going to happen. Then they throw in another fantasy, which is Russia will subject itself to, um, you know, international tribunals and Putin will go on trial. Do people understand that Putin literally just signed uh, uh, directives? He's withdrawn from the European community. He says none of the interaction that took place since the 90s, the treaties, the cooperation and all this stuff, it's all done. Russia is a sovereign state and it doesn't care one hoot about Europe. And tomorrow he's given a big speech. And a lot of people are saying that that speech is, boom, the flare in the air and the war begins. And at that point in time, Russia will never negotiate with anybody. I mean, we, we missed our window of opportunity. Once Putin pulls the trigger, and I think that trigger is going to be pulled tomorrow, this ain't over until Russia says it's over. And that could be short, it could be long. Who knows? I mean, the, Ger the, the, the British are sending 14 Challenger tanks. Wow, 14, Judge. That's a company. 
You know how long a company in isolation survives on the battlefield? Not very Not long. very long. Yeah. When um, uh, Zhaluzhny, I think I have the, the name yep. right, the commander-in-chief of the Russian military gave that interview to um, The Economist yeah. magazine where Zelensky sat there while Zhaluzhny did the talking. Did the talking, yeah. And he said he wanted 500 tanks. You said to me, he wants an army. He wants an <laughs> army, yeah. So yeah. Great Britain's giving him a company. Wow. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Scott Ritter, always a pleasure, man. Very, very uh, fascinating, fascinating, terrifying, but fascinating uh, insight.